So hello and welcome back to another whopper of a chapter where Tercel and Harrier and all of the Isvani people are trying to decide what they need to do now. They're being attacked by Aniron and her her creations, and they they seem to be having quite the dilemma because they can't heal Saravase. I mean, they can, but if they do, then they will be enthralled by her creatures, and they can't really figure out what they need to do um, other than try to survive. That that seems to be their, their goal, but it also seems like it's going to be very, very difficult. Tercel has been having nightmares as he traveled through the desert with Visochim to get back to Harrier and the rest of the Isvai people, and he at least thinks that they're nightmares. Put a pin in that, that will come back to haunt everybody in a little while. Other than that, I hope everybody is doing good. We are having a... definitely it feels more like fall now. Um, we aren't really having, like, cold weather, but we aren't really having warm weather either. Unfortunately, we still haven't had much in the way of rain, which we really do need. I hate to wish for a snowy winter, but that might be our saving grace. Either that or maybe a really wet winter, although that sounds sloppy and miserable. But we do need a little bit of rain. On a really good note, uh, this extended autumn is is doing wonders for my two Brussels sprouts plants that have escaped the attention of the deer. I'll, I'll have to try and update it. But my little Brussels sprouts, now that I've remembered that they need water, are actually growing. I mean, nothing else in the garden is because we're getting... We're getting either between light to hard frosts almost every night, but for whatever reason, Brussels sprouts are like, hey, yeah, we like cold weather. So that's kind of cool. The, the Isvani people probably would like to have some Brussels sprouts or really much of anything, as we will see as we jump back into Chapter 9, my recap of The Phoenix Transformed by Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory, and Chapter 9 is titled Bitter Harvest. Chapter 9 picks up uh, with a character that we haven't seen in at least a little while, and we are getting the perspective of Aniron, who is amusing herself shall we say, out in the desert. And we're going to begin with the wonderful description, which I think gives a, a really good insight into her character, which is so different from that of the Endarkened, who were much more... They seemed much more grown up in comparison. Quoting... On the sands of the Isvai, Aniron played her games of flesh and form. In the days since she had come to the world of form, she had discovered its limitations and hers. If her flesh prison was not to exist in a bespelled sleep, it must be constantly tended, and flesh required grosser food than spirit did. Pain and death nourished her magic, but not her body. She would not die if it did, for an elemental spirit could not die, but she would be trapped within the husk as it rotted away, and once she slipped free of it, she would be diminished in power, greatly diminished. It should have been the task of he who called her to tend to this body, he had crafted an image that Anira knew he found pleasing, and yet he had spurned it and her. Once he bowed to her, she would grant him immortality so that he might spend a thousand centuries regretting that lapse in judgment. 
So we see that Aniron in the body that Nisa Chim has formed for her has to actually eat and drink and do all of the things that a a actual like human or flesh form would along with feeding off of pain and fear and death the way that the Indarkin do and she resents the fact that she has to tend to her own, her own body he she's thinking about all the things that she wants to do to be so Jim, but first he must swear fealty to her. But he must swear fealty to her first so that she could fully claim the world for her, for her children, and for her kin who she would liberate from the cold dark place which she had been released from once her power was great enough. Then, her kind could sweep across the face of the land, bodiless, feeding upon the offerings that her slaves would render up. Or her kin might it choose instead to take forms of flesh such as an iron and her children would be able to create with their power. But they would be free. She likes the idea of freeing all of her kindred. I don't think she's thought that through enough, because as we saw with the Indarkened, yeah, they're free, but they're always contending with each other, and I can't imagine that these elemental beings that are trying to become the next version of Indarkened would be much different. But before all these things might take place, Aniron must win that that should have been hers by right, and so she needed minions to do her will. He who is was the wellspring of all darkness, and he who is would never return to the world of form, but the creatures of darkness had fashioned that he had fashioned had not all passed away when their makers had been destroyed. Some of them slept, waiting only to be awakened. Some had lost physical reality, but the possibility remained, and so they could be evoked anew. Most were creatures of northern darkness and northern cold, but Aniron had summoned them forth nonetheless. The death wings from their sleep in caverns in the depths of the remote mountains, the cold wargs from their ancient ice-bound hunting ground far away from the land of men or elves, the Duragar, cousins of the long-vanished ice trolls, summoned from the bowels of the earth where few creatures of light or dark ventured, only to see the remnants of the glory of Shadow Mountain fail and die as they tried to answer her call. Of all the creatures of darkness from the ancient days of Shadow Mountain, none but the goblins, the Balwarta, and the Salawa were hers to command still. She must have more others to do her will here in the hot, bright southern lands. So she's been playing with things that she finds in the desert and twisting them and reforming them to uh, harry the is by people, basically. But she's having a lot of fun twisting things. She's taking things like scorpions and desert snakes right down to little tiny termites and twisting them to the darkness. Unfortunately, that's making her cranky. The more she was forced to toil, the greater grew in Iron's anger at how badly she had been treated. He who she would have made king of men had been willful and mad, and he had spurned her, leaving her to make her way alone as best as she could, turning her vast powers to these menial tasks. I, I like that we're getting a real insight into an iron as almost a petulant child. In a lot of ways, I see the way that they're characterizing her as like a dark foil of Kerta, the unicorn, who is also a little spoiled, a little petulant, a little bratty, but ultimately good. Aniron seems to be like the dark mirror of Kerta, and 
I kind of like that comparison, which honestly, not going to lie, I just, that comparison just kind of hit me right now as I was talking. So Aniron is playing and twisting all of these forms, and she comes across something that she thinks will probably make Viso Chim turn to her in maybe desperation, but maybe, maybe gladly. And she, she's thinking about Viso Chim and how she had trapped him. And she had baited that trap in a way he should find impossible to resist, for had not his desire to preserve his dragon from death been the means by which she had sh secured her escape into this time-bound realm initially? And so she's prepared all of these nasty surprises, absolutely certain that Biso Chim is probably going to turn to her any time now. And so doing that, she summons the fire crown back. Suddenly, the fire crown was there. You are not yet victorious, it said. I shall be, an iron said de defiantly, tossing her head. I shall scour the people of he who is, who has called me, from the face of the desert, the way the sand wind scours lichen from a rock. Every night, as they set forth, Bisochim will know that when the sun rises, there will be less of them. I shall wring their lives from his grasp, no matter how hungrily he clutches at them, and all the spells of he who has called me will not prevail against my power. So who will he be able to turn to for their salvation except me? So her plan to get Bisochim to capitulate to her will is just to pick away at the people that he's trying to protect night after night until he's despairs and and turns to her but the fire crown doubts that that's going to work and and iron's like that's okay because even if he doesn't i found one of those blue robe mages that you said didn't exist anymore and she summons forth a, a wild mage that she found in the last remaining Itreyu city. She stretched out her hand. There was a sound of struggle and groans, and then a young man in the blue robes of a southern wild mage came staggering up the steps to her tower roof, moving as though he struggled against a compulsion. His blue robes were torn and filthy, his face bloody and battered. He strained to hurl himself over the edge of the tower, and when he couldn't, he glared at an iron. She taunts this wild mage and and says, All you have to do is serve me and and I'll I'll ease your torment. But if you don't serve me, I I'll kill everyone in your family, everyone you've ever known, and everyone that you've ever loved. He smiled and spat at her feet. If you can, demon, you cannot force me to kneel to you. Your power is not that great. And an iron in true and darkened form shows that her power is indeed that great by torturing him and breaking his body until he is kneeling, although unwillingly. And she's doing all this to kind of show off to the fire crown. She thinks that this is going to work, but it doesn't. The wild mage denies her to the very last and actually manages to throw himself off the side of the building that he is talking to her on, which completely makes an iron lose control and basically have a temper tantrum while the fire crown stands there and says you are not yet victorious you have held two wielders of the wild magic in your thrall and you could not corrupt them either through prizes or duress so why should i believe that you are powerful enough to claim this world an iron she then boasts to the fire crown 
no, fine. We're going to, we're going to change our bargain. I will not only enthrall he who, it, who called me, but I will also enthrall the fire crown boy, Tercel, and his companion, and all three will serve me. And she taunts the fire crown by saying, look to yourself, fire crown, lest when the day comes, as it definitely will, I don't need you anymore. The fire crown, who... It's interesting because I keep wondering, knowing how the book turns out, he's not, and, and I say he, it's an it, but it's not evil, but it's also not good. It's like a true chaotic neutral entity. It's willing to make a bargain with an iron. If she gains ultimate power, then it will join with her, but it's also not really helping her <laughs> and it says that it would be foolish not to seek an alliance with whichever power holds the future of the land and an iron's like yeah you would be really dumb not to ally with me and the fire crown is so deliberate in its language saying that whoever holds the power in the land is who it would ally with. And Iron, like most evil in books, only hears what she wants to hear. And she says, when I summon you again, you must be prepared to give me everything that you've promised. And the Fire Crown says, I accept the terms you now propose. And in token of that, I tell you this, upon the day that our bargain is fulfilled will come an end to many things. So, Aniron thinks that he is saying that she will be victorious because we learn later that the fire sprouts had the gift of prophecy that stems from the fire crown. So he's looking at it and saying, yeah, Somebody's going to win, and whoever's going to win, I will ally with. Aniron is only hearing, somebody's going to win, and to her mind, she's thinking, you are going to win, is what he's saying. And so, they they have amended the terms of their first bargain, and that is where we leave them, and shift back to what is going on with the Isvani people and Harrier and Tercel and everybody else. So I'm going to grab a little drink and then we are going to try to sum up what happens in a very, very big last chunk of this chapter. Give me one second. All right, so we leave Aniron and the Fire Crown to their... Well, Aniron's plans. The Fire Crown just goes off to wherever he goes when he's not being summoned by demons. And we shift over to the Isvai people. And Harrier is sitting there kind of trying to have a strategy meeting. He says, I figure we have three choices right now, Harrier said. One's impossible, two is useless, and three, well... <laughs> Three is impossible, too, but at least it'll take longer. The four of them were sitting under the awning in front of Sharia's tent in the brief, cool desert twilight. So they're sitting there, and they're trying to figure out what to do now. It's the evening after the Balwarta, the, the like, flying scorpion attack, and everybody is kind of trying to recover from that. They're going to sit there and wait for plans to be made before they move north again. Since now that Biso Chim has rejoined them, there was no reason for them not all to gather together because Biso Chim, with much more power than, than Harrier, can definitely call more water. And so all of the Isvi people can actually travel as a group instead of strung out, which Harrier thinks might be better, but 
also might be worse since they'll all be gathered together in one spot and probably be very attractive to goblins, but they can't think of anything else. Tristel is startled into laughing at Harrier's, you know, laying out that he can think of three really dumb things to do. He says, all right, I can see now why you wanted me to come up with ideas for what to do next before you tried to get everybody else. So uh, what, what are your grand ideas, Harrier? Harrier says, all right, my first idea is that we trap an iron here in the desert and we kill her. Tercel shakes his head. And yeah, that one seems to be impossible because if Biso Chim can't kill her, then obviously the three of them also can't. Harrier continues with his second grand idea, which is that uh, you and I kill Biso Chim and we kill ourselves. And then, you know, we'll, we'll deny her what she wants and, you know, Obviously, none of us are going to give her what she wants as far as capitulating to her. So we'll just all do away with ourselves. And yeah, that, that'll be great. Of course, Harrier amends that that probably would result in the death of all the Isvi people. And it doesn't really do anything about stopping her or getting any help to stop her. But uh, that, that, that's plan number two. Shariah asks, do you not have any sensible plans? And Harrier says, no. My third plan is for all of us to head north and see how many of us can make it to Arameth alive. Tercel thinks that those are all very, 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 very stupid plans. He points out that it took a fortnight just to get from the Lake of Fire to where they are now, where they don't even really know where they are, except for the fact that it's somewhere near Abi Abadashar. And the desert is, you know, it's, it's big, it's full of sand, and how on earth are we going to cross the desert with all these people? And that's even just to get to the edge of the desert, and then it's still another month of journeying before you can get to Aramath. And Harrier's like, well, obviously, somebody needs to trap an iron, which means elven mages. He, he doesn't know if Saravase can get through uh, to the elves with an iron spell on her. So, yeah, the only thing he can think of to do is try to make it to, to the Golden City. Tercella asks, So you're planning on walking to Aramath with 10,000 Isvai people? That's a really stupid plan. Well, I thought of taking them all to the Elven Cities, but that's even farther away and they can't make it through Palasha's Vale. Come on, Tercel. I know it's a stupid plan. I just don't have a better plan. You're up. Your turn. Tercel stands up and he comes up with some plans as well. He thinks that they could all go to Abi Abadashar and just stay there because it's warded against, uh, against the dark, obviously. Bisochim couldn't even find it. He says it's it's a big place and we could all go there and Shirai is like and then we would all die. The the city does not have enough resources to feed all of the people that would be descending on it. And so that plan is out. Um Tercel's next plan <laughs> which is equally as bad as any of Tercel or any of Harrier's plans, is that, you know, maybe somebody, one of them, somebody else, well, actually, he says somebody else, could heal Saravase so that she can fly to the elves, and whoever heals Saravase, we just immediately kill so that, you know, we don't have to worry about them being tainted. Harrier stares at Tercel and is like, oh, sure, yeah, that's a great plan. 
Of course, you don't know any healing spells. There are no wild mages here except for me and Bisochim, and we definitely couldn't use Bisochim to heal Saravase and then kill him because that would get rid of Saravase. So uh, you're you're saying you want me to heal Saravase and then you're going to kill me. Tercel obviously had not thought that one through, and he's just like, um, okay, bad plan. You're right. We're just going to have to think of something else. But no matter how hard they try to think of other things that they can do, the only plan that they actually come up with that seems to have any hope of, of possibly helping anything is to make their way towards Aramath. That's the only thing they can think of. Unfortunately, Aniron's plans to chip away at the Izvai people are in full effect, and every night they, they run into more issues. Her attacks never did more than kill a few people every time, but that was enough to let the Izvani know that she could kill far more of them if she chose. Soon it was clear to everyone that the return to the Izvai desert would not be the return to the familiar home that they yearned for. It would be the start of a long and perilous journey. Shariah points out that she had been planning on going to Abi Abadashar when they hit the Izvai Desert and bringing all of the Nalzindar to join the rest of the Izvani people, but that doesn't seem like it's going to be the grandest plan. And so they amend their plan, and so... As the fortress of the crowned horns had been for the elves so long ago, they plan that Abi Abadashar would become a refuge for the children and the children to be of the Isvani people. So, just like the elves before them, they want to preserve something. They aren't sure how much they're going to be able to preserve, but they do at least want to take all of the pregnant women and all of the children. They classify children a little bit differently than Harrier and Tercel think, um, according to all of the Isvani people. They they're sending only children under the age of 12 back to Abi Abadashar and everybody else who isn't pregnant or a child is going to join the rest of the Isvani people and try to make it to Aramath. They argue about this a little bit because Harry or Intercell really would like maybe maybe for them to consider the age of adulthood to at least be like 15, 16, but after a decent amount of arguing, Shariah leads the children under the age of 12 and the few, there really aren't many, pregnant women back to Abi Abadashar and brings the rest of the Nalzindar tribe out and meets everybody out in the desert. They make it there and back safely. And I thought this was quite the uh, the poignant little line. That all of them went and returned safely was a miracle. It was the last miracle the Isvani would receive. Thankfully, because they have Bisochim with them, he's actually been able to help a little bit. He's able to call water. He's able to, to do thunderbolts that can slay the flying, uh, flying scorpions. He can even, to a degree, you know, help against goblin attacks because unlike Harrier or Tercel, when he calls fire, he has Saravase's magic to call on. So he's kind of their biggest weapon. So Aniron sends something new. And she sends uh, spell-twisted dogs after them. 
And for whatever reason, Bisochim's spells don't seem to work on these black dogs. And the only thing that saves the Isvani people is their own dogs fighting these black dogs, which is sort of the biggest um, heart-wrenching moment, at least for the Isvani people, because they lose all of their hunting companion dogs, except for the puppies that were still young enough to be carried in carrying baskets, but their dogs did turn the tide and, and actually saved all of the people. It took the Isvani 60 days to cross the Baralath, and at the end of that, 984 Zvani had died by the time they reached Kanata Well. So we've reached at least the edge of, of the hottest, driest part of the desert. And Harrier is really close to despair because he's watched these people that he's come to know just getting whittled away bit by bit by bit by bit. And he sits down because he's been arguing with Tercel. He's trying not to burden Shariah with his issues. But Leofa, the oldest of the Isvani, is still with them. And he sits down and he talks with her a little while. And she points out to him that... Um, that's great. You know, we've made it to the edge of the Isvai. Uh, we've lost a lot of people. That's not good. We've lost all of our hunting companion Ikulus hounds, except for these few puppies that we have. But have you thought, Harrier, she drops another problem on his lap, that uh, we probably aren't going to be able to feed ourselves. And, um, we aren't really sure because Aniron has changed everything in the desert so badly that all of the landmarks that the Isvani people use to travel from oasis to oasis are just gone. So Harrier is now worried that they're going to starve. He's also worried that Aniron is going to keep throwing things at him, which seems obvious. And he's now also worried that they're not going to be able to even find the edge of the desert and that they're all just going to wander around until they starve to death. Not exactly something that you think a 17 or 18 year old should have to worry about, but there it is. And that is when Aniron unleashes her, not final attack, but her most ingenious question mark attack that was foreshadowed heavily by Tercel's dreams. And I'm going to grab another drink, and then we are going to hopefully finish up this chapter. Sorry about that. The change in the weather keeps drying me out. Winter is definitely coming. So Harrier is thinking as they're riding along. They've gotten out of the barrel up left and they reach the first well, which is great. And he's trying to think how long it's been since they've had like a direct attack from an iron. And he's like, all right, well, we got to the well. And that had no incident. They spent the night at that first well. That makes two days without incident. And they had continued north. They had, something had attacked the, the camp, but nobody died that day. So maybe two days without any sort of, like, direct attack. But um, he, he's expecting something soon. And he does think that maybe he shouldn't be expecting an iron to keep a schedule, but by scrubbing the Isvai, the desert, clean of life, an iron had effectively forced them all to really group very much together. 
because they've discovered that Bisochim can at least make grass grow from the roots near the oasises. But without Bisochim to make the grass grow, all of their flocks, their goats and their sheep and their shotars, would starve. And without their animals, then the Isvani people would also starve. So they're definitely bunched together, which is causing a few of the issues that um, Bisochim ran into with so many differing personalities traveling together. One of the personalities that um, Harrier keeps bumping up against is one of the tribal leaders, Sathan, um, who argues with Harrier all the time. And as Harrier is thinking about what Aniron might throw at them next, Sathan rides up and is like, eh, I think we should stop here. Harrier tells him, no, that's not really a good idea. And suddenly Harrier has a very bad feeling as Sothan is like, what, are you, is your wild magic telling you this? Or do you just want to push us beyond our limits? They discover yet another one of Niren's surprises as Harrier argues and starts to get a weird sense about where Sothan wants to stop. And what they find is kind of sounds like a trapdoor spider that is under the desert. Harrier, his shotar gets eaten by it. He fights it. And unfortunately, they, they don't stop. Sothan, I think, gets cut to pieces by the thing. And that's kind of... How it, how it keeps going. Um, Bisochim is able to kill this, I mean, the description sounds like kind of a trapdoor spider or maybe an antlion living in, in the sand. He freezes it and unfortunately they lose more people to it and keep on, keep on going. They had been out of the Bareleth for a fortnight now. Aside from three more encounters with the giant shotar-eating Ashtaban Jari, Tercel had named them Sandwalkers, pointing out that that was shorter than the name giant shotar-eating Ashtaban Jari. But aside from that, Aniron had left them alone. Harrier had a hunch that Aniron had just created the Sandwalkers and let them loose, which meant she hadn't actually attacked them directly since they had left the Bareleth. But he isn't sure that that's a good thing because he's very afraid that she's cooking up something worse. But for now, they were surviving. At each midday halt, Bisochim called up a spring and then made the desert flourish as well as he could. His success in this depended on whether or not there were roots buried under the sand. If there were, he could make them grow. They had at least been able to stop feeding the animals off the stored supplies, and Harrier had insisted that they hold the rest of the roots of the mature plants and the rest of the grain in reserve. Because just as Bisochim could turn buried roots into mature plants in hours, they hoped he could turn seeds into a harvestable crop in the same amount of time, which should double or triple their grain. He would definitely have to. Because Harrier's plan now is to make it to the, the biggest of the oasises, which is Sapathruk Oasis, and try to restock there. But it's still... A, a problem for them. And the problem is the fact that they don't have enough food to probably make it to this oasis, which is not even all the way to the northernmost city at the edge of the desert, 
which is where they they need to get to so that they can start getting to Aramath. Harrier thinks they they might have enough food and livestock to make it two months, but he isn't even sure about that. So the grand plan now is to make it to the Oasis, assuming that they can find it, and hopefully resupply there. Hopefully he's banking a lot on the fact that Visa Chim will be able to make things grow around this oasis so that they can double or maybe even triple their supplies so that they can maybe make it to the northernmost city of the, uh, the desert so that they can maybe make it to uh, Aramath. There's a lot of maybes in this plan, and Harrier realizes that there's a lot of maybes in this plan, but... Even if the wells in the oasises in the desert had not all gone dry because of Bisuchim's meddling, something that they wouldn't know until they looked, but even if they could, the Isvani could not dependably find those places anymore. With all of the desert plans gone because of Aniron's meddling, the landmarks that the people had relied on all their lives had shifted so much that Tercel was as likely to know where something was as the Isvani people. Harrier doesn't think that they're even going to make it to Kanatha well, but hopefully they will, because they need a water source that's not created by magic one day and gone in the next. They need a, a food source that Bisuchim could renew, and it they need a place where they could reach within the next two months. So they're going to try to find this oasis and hopefully they'll be able to. So that's what they're doing. They're traveling to hopefully find an oasis and they're, they're going along. When Tercel is questioning Harrier about why, Harrier says, all right, say it's a moon turn to the oasis, the way Shariah says it is. Say we spend a said night there, building up our supplies. After that, maybe more than two moon turns to the city, and then another moon turn, because even if he has to dispel them, to get to Aramath. So, half a year since an iron has gotten loose by the time we maybe make it to to the city. Do you think that anything is going to matter by the time that happens? And uh, Tercel says, you're right. That doesn't sound practical. It doesn't sound like anything. So let's go to the elves. Harrier says, that's even farther and, you know, fine. Say we go to the elves, it would still be eight moon turns instead of five, and no guarantees that we could get through. They're arguing about what on earth they're supposed to do when Harrier senses something. He says, light and darkness, come on. Tercel didn't stop to wonder what Harrier had heard or sensed or whatever. He just grabbed a cloak and a spear and ran after him. He hadn't gone two steps outside of their tent before he heard Saravase. say, There are strangers coming. Arm yourselves! Harrier swore again, and Tercel groaned under his breath. Sound carried for miles in the desert, and they could hear the noises that meant that the Shotars were upset and getting ready to run, which meant the goats had probably already run, and the sheep were probably thinking about it. They seemed to spend half their time chasing the herds and the other half of their time trying to feed them. They run to see what on earth Saravase has seen, and one of the tribesmen says, Those are men. And Harrier says, no. I don't know what is coming at us, but those aren't men. 
by the glow of mage light, Tercel could see see the things coming at them. There were too many bodies to count, all walking slowly forward across the sands. Bakudin was right. They looked like people. Tresel made his next ball of mage light sweep low, shining its light full on their faces. And then he could finally see more clearly. They were naked and barefoot, but every one of them carried some weapon, even if it was nothing more than a length of wood. Their skin was as dark as cured leather, stretched across their bones so tightly it seemed as if there was no longer any flesh at all. Their eyes were nothing more than dark holes in their skulls, and their mouths hung open in eternal silent screams. And Niren has made zombies. <laughs> and Tercel suddenly recalls his dream of a Niren walking through the streets of Tarnatha Atreyu, followed by the dead. Tercel had been really sure that those were just nightmares, but now he thinks, what if they weren't? And this sets a little niggling worry into the back of Tercel's mind that will haunt him going forward. So just put a pin in that and remember that Tercel dreamed about these. Some of the young warriors that had been led by Xanatar rush forward to meet these dead things. He's like, uh, we've fought men before, me and my warriors. We can do it again. And they rush forward. Tercel expects Harrier to stop them or something, but Harrier is just kind of standing there, frozen, looking absolutely terrified. And finally, Saravase calls for Harrier, which seems to shock him out of his days, but he still doesn't stop Xanatar's people. He runs to Saravase, where he finds out that not only is it one group of these zombies, but they're, they're surrounded. And everybody starts trying to fight. Tercel wants to know what he should do, and Harrier says, um, make light. I mean, you're not a fighter. The only thing you can really do is stay here and keep making mage light. If we all die, take Bisochim and Saravase and run for Aramath. And off goes Harrier to try to fight. We shift perspectives over to Shariya and Sinarin, and they're running to see what on earth they're, they're fighting, because she wasn't there with Harrier and Tercel when they got their first glimpse at these zombie things. So she is running, not knowing what she's facing, only knowing that it's not coming from the sky, at least. As they ran towards the battlefield, Shariah saw a man that she knew, Hayden of the Kadastar, dragging an injured Isvani back across the sand. The woman still breathed, though her chadar was gone and her face was covered with blood. The stump of a spear protruded from her chest, and with each laboring breath she took, she sprayed fresh blood. What enemy? Shariah demanded. Her people stopped with her. Men, said Hayden. Ashtaban men. They cannot die, and their numbers increase. You must help me get this woman to be so chim. She must not die. She is dying now, Hayden said Shariah. Even Bisochim cannot call her back away from death. She waves her warriors forward towards the battle, and she's going to help give mercy to this woman. But to her astonishment, Hayden grabs Shariah and yells, no, she, she must not die. We must not let this one die. And Shariah's like, dude, chill. She's, she's dying. 
She's dying right now, and Hayden yells for everyone to get back. And the woman dies, and then stands back up and joins the battle on the side of the zombies. So this, and Iron is clever in this, in, in making what sounds like the worst nightmare of zombie zombification, where everyone that you kill just rises back up and starts fighting you. It sounds like quite the nightmare. Shariah looks around and is trying to figure out how to fight them. Thankfully, they do realize that um, that the only thing that they can do is chop them to pieces that are too small to do harm. She says, This will not matter if what lies undead can do no harm. Tonight, we will be butchers, not warriors. It took them far longer than Shariah wanted to do what needed to be done. She hardened her spirit to the work. The things were no longer Renerda, no longer anyone she knew, merely an iron's tool. Even when there was no body, only bits of flesh, the pieces still twitched and writhed on the sand. But at least then they could no longer hold a weapon or choke the life out of the living. So the battle goes. Most people realize fairly quickly what Shariah and everyone else realized, that if someone is about to die, they're going to be turned against you. And so the battle is not only against these zombies, but against yourself and against possibly your own friends. It becomes a butcher's field and not a battleground because if somebody is about to die from these these zombies they instead of trying to do anything with them just throw them back into the press of zombies so that at least they won't take anybody else with them harrier finally realizes that the only weapon that might work against them is fire and the Ashtaban corpses, which is what they're being called, begin burning. They burned in silence, as if they were unaware that they burned. The ancient dead kindled in a flash, their ancient rags burst into flame. The robes of the freshly dead burned bright for a few moments, but the dead still burned, and their scorching flesh gave off black smoke. All of them walked onward as they brightly burned. The ancient dead were the first to fall, crumbling away into fragments of charcoal and embers. Only the fresh killed now remained. Barely a score of bodies shambling across the sand. Finally, they came until Bisuchim sets them with even brighter fire. Harrier staggered to a stop, sank to his knees in the sand. Fire destroys them, he said. Sometimes I guess you need a new, really big one. I should have thought of that sooner. And so, Aniron has unleashed her probably most terrible weapon. I'm glad that, that the Indarkins never thought to use zombies, because, ew, it's... Not really um, something I would want to fight. I've never been a fan of The Walking Dead or any of the other zombie movies. And this was distressing to me, to say the least, to think about it. They tally up the dead. Oh, wow. The bright light has made a lot of darkness. Hang on. Um, all right. That helps the lighting at least a little bit. Not much, though. You would think that the natural sunlight would make for awesome lighting, but not when it's hitting full in the face and doing things. Anyway, we're going to finish this up, though. So they, they try to tally up the dead. 
they try to tally up everything. It's everyone is sort of shell shocked after this attack, and who could blame them because it's probably an iron's most insidious attack, but they hope that they have maybe gotten rid of them all. And the next day, the sky was lightening with dawn before the last of the pieces of the Ashtaban corpses had been cleared from the battlefield and consumed by fire. Tercel had named the creatures Shamblers, and soon it was a name that everyone used, for to use such a new name was better than to hold upon the tongue and in your heart the knowledge that Aniron had taken for her own that which should have been left to return to the desert in payment for all that its owner had taken. Shariah hoped that never would there be need of the name Shambler again, save to think of things that lay in the past. When their total of dead was reckoned, it was not as great as Shariah had feared that it must be, though heavy enough. The greatest part of the losses had fallen onto the tents of the Lazindar Isvani, whose people had followed Xanatar and, followed and fought beside him. But their other losses were cause enough for sorrow. The Kazaman Isvani were gone. No more would their leader argue with others over goats or sheep, and the name of the Kazaman itself would be entered upon the tally of lost tribes along with the other tribes. The leader of the Adante had followed a, the leader of the Karnab in death less than a moon turn after becoming the leader. And if the Adante could not now find another leader, then there would be no more Adante either. But despite a night, which had harrowed the heart, even as it had wearied the body, the first dimming of the stars saw the tents being struck and the shotars being packed and saddled because no one wanted to remain on the killing ground. And that is where the chapter ends with a zombie attack that, honestly, it sounds like at least they're slow zombies which is better than than the fast scary zombies but even slow zombies sound like something i wouldn't want to deal with ever at all yuck <laughs> but yeah so now we know everybody's plans we know that aniron is planning on just whittling away until biso chim gives in and tells her that he will do anything to stop and preserve his people, including helping her. We know that Harrier's grand plan, which seems to be the only grand plan that anyone can think of, is to just head for Arameth and hope that at least a couple people make it so that they can warn the city and hopefully find maybe a wild mage up in the city to go to the elves. And Tercel, well, Tercel doesn't seem to have a plan at all right now. We'll have to wait and see if they can even make it to the oasis where Harrier is hopeful that maybe the food situation will at least get a little bit better because it sounds like they're also facing starvation. This is a much bleaker book than the first trilogy was, I think. I mean, Kellen had to face cold, which is terrible, but at least nobody in the elven army was starving, which it sounds like Harrier and everybody else will be doing very soon unless they can find the oasis. That is where we're going to leave it tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, leave me a thumbs up if you don't mind. These, I'm never sure how well I'm doing with them, but I'm trying. So just thank you so much for listening, and I will see you later.